See, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Those with loaded guns, and those who dig. And this is the grave of Henry Burgess. So, how uncanny is that? <laughs> I'm in the beautiful Bexley Square in Salford. And I've always loved this little bit because of that pub there, the new Oxford. It's a brilliant pub, but I'm not here for that today. Angel Meadow has bred its fair share of wild men. From the infamous Bob Orridge, dubbed Manchester's public enemy, number one, he caused chaos on the streets of Manchester for decades due to his sinister underworld involvement in criminal activities he had many tussles and altercations with Manchester's very own Sherlock Holmes Jerome Caminada his rap sheet consisted of burglaries armed robberies and even shooting his way through two police officers but nobody was quite as wild as the next lad I'm going to introduce. He struck the fear of God into every single person that he came in contact with. And nobody was safe in his company. Ladies and gents, meet Henry Burgess. The ultimate wild man of Angel Meadow. Henry was the right hand man to the head boy of the twisted and crazy Angel Meadow lads. They were a group of scuttlers that spawned from the dwellings and hovels of the surrounding streets. Ludgate Hill. Aspen Lane. St. Michael's Place, just to name a few. It was described as being a feral bunch of ruffians with no respect for anything or anyone. They had a fearsome reputation and could battle with the best of them. Come on, lads, let's go. Even though Henry wasn't the head boy of his gang, people feared him the most. Listen, you want to stay away from him. He's trouble. Due to his unpredictability and reckless actions. From a very young age, he was breaking the law. Petty crime, stealing, causing havoc. As the years rolled on, he grew increasingly more volatile and aggressive. It's believed his father was also of the same nature. At some point in Henry's life, his dad was carted off and he spent the rest of his days in a lunatic asylum. And sadly, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. His criminal mindset and his two fingers up at authority made a potent combination for the life of crime, leaving many in his path scarred from being in his presence. And even his own girlfriend lost an eye. As a result of an argument gone wrong. 
He thrived off fighting his rival scuttling gangs. But nothing gave him a bigger buzz than fighting with the police. On July the 21st, 1884, the Manchester Evening News reported an incident that took place. It was titled, More Ruffianism in Angel Meadow, a desperate character. The article describes at 11 o'clock at night, there was a disturbance in Angel Meadow and how Burgess delivered a barrage of insults to a beat constable. He was shouting to the officer, quote, your days are numbered, I'll put you out tonight. After this, Burgess took off and vanished into the dead of night, only to be seen moments later, wild eyed, crazy looking and barefoot, carrying a poker in one hand and a knife in the other. <laughs> the policeman immediately drew his staff to defend himself, and the officer swung a blow at Burgess, but missed, only to receive a clubbing whack from the poker that Henry had in his hand, before taking off again. Around an hour had passed, and the officer was now joined by another beat constable. By this time they were on the lookout for Burgess, creeping down the ginnels in the back streets sniffing him out then out of nowhere Burgess appeared again Come on! crazier than ever but this time the police officer struck first with a crashing blow to the head of Burgess with his truncheon leaving Emery on the ground who was immediately arrested he was taken to court and the judge Mr R A Armitage said he had never listened to a longer criminal record than the one that had been read out against this criminal and his only sorry is that he couldn't give him a longer sentence with that Burgess received the maximum sentence possible serving only six months in strange ways prison So as you can see from a very young age, Henry was just like a wild out of control character and I think if you would have seen him in town you would have just avoided him at all costs because it wasn't worth the, the drama and the aggravation that came with him. But sadly the trail of destruction carried on throughout Henry's life and as a result of one of his unpredictable outbursts and rage he actually took the life of an innocent young lad in Angel Meadow. May, 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 1893, sees Henry Burgess commit his most wicked and devious crime yet. <laughs> Thomas Matthews was a hard working young lad, and like many, he was born into the era of poverty. But he had a loving family, brothers, sisters, a wife, and his own little daughter. And one Saturday night in May, Thomas was walking home and presumably he was knocked down by a woman called Kathleen Lyons in Angel Meadow. Thomas's brother helped him up off the ground and escorted him to his mum's house on Old Mount Street. Once he'd settled, it's believed a row broke out, resulting in Henry Burgess being sent for. Go and get Henry. And as we all know, it didn't take much to persuade Henry to get involved. Once he arrived, there was a small crowd congregating near the foot of the door of Thomas's mum's house. Women were exchanging punches and Burgess steamed into the scuffle, throwing wild winging punches towards Thomas and his family, to which he was shoved away from the ruckus. Henry then ran back to a house on Nicholas Street which was only a stone's throw away from Mount Street. 
There was only one thing on his mind. Chaos. The destructive side of Burgess was about to rear its ugly head. And what followed would scar its way into the history books of Angel Meadows past. Without hesitation, he picked up an oil lamp off the side of the mantelpiece and began to shake it up, stoking up the contents and illuminating the inside. And as bold as brass, he walked over towards the direction of Thomas and without batting an eyelid, he launched the oil lamp at Thomas, which immediately engulfed him in flames. Henry stood back, almost proud of what he'd just achieved, <laughs> as the flames torched the poor Thomas Matthews. Screaming and immersed in flames, his shocked family came to his assistance, smothering him with the shawls and coats. As the smoke and smell of burning flesh emanated from the scorched body and it filled the air of Angel Meadow. Thomas was rushed to Manchester Royal Infirmary, fighting for his life, as Manchester's very own Sherlock Holmes, a most feared scuttling detective, Get your coat you needed. Jerome Caminado, made light work of hunting down Burgess, who at this point had tried to make himself scarce. He was bundled to the floor and arrested and taken into police custody, along with other members of his crew who instigated the incident. Thomas Matthews fought ever so hard to try and stay alive, but sadly, he died only a short while after, due to the injuries. It's believed his body was unrecognisable after the attack, and on his deathbed, he said this, I was at my mother's house, sitting on the doorstep when a man named Henry Burgess came at me. I'd not had any bad quarrels with Henry Burgess and I'd not seen him for about a fortnight but I've known him for about three years. Henry Burgess threw the lamp at me and he didn't say anything before he did. I'm now an inmate of the Manchester Royal Infirmary. I'm very ill and I believe I'm going to die. Henry Burgess received only 12 months in prison for taking the life of poor Thomas Matthews. The case was dropped from murder to manslaughter on the grounds that Burgess said he didn't intentionally mean for the lamp to hit Thomas. Well, I didn't mean it, did I? 12 months for the life of a lad that had so much going for him. His family had never been the same, and his poor daughter <laughs> would live the rest of her life without a dad by her side. <laughs> right, so here I am. I'm on the old stomping ground of Angel Meadow once again. <laughs> um, it is bitterly cold and very eerily quiet today around Manchester, especially this area. This, even though this is the park, it's normally, you can normally hear like, well, you can probably hear the train going over the top now. Um, but you normally hear the city sort of reverberating its sound around here, but it's so still today. Um, but anyway, enough of that. Like I said in the video, I'll be taking you to the actual locations of where these stories that I'm going to be touching on, I'm going to be taking you to the exact spots where they took place or near as damn it. Now, I have to tip my hat and give credit to Days of Horror um, for this little section that I'm going to be covering because he brought this to my attention um, over a year ago and the story stuck with me so I'll leave a link below so you can check out Chris's video, Chris and Vicky's video um, but like I say um, this where I am is Old Mount Street if you can just see it in the back there um, and this is where Henry Burgess basically killed Paul Thomas back in 1893 on this very street. Now, you've just got to imagine this place being so, so dark. 
poverty on an unprecedented scale. Um, and like where I am now on Old Mount Street, this is pretty much the same layout as how it would have been. Obviously, these buildings and our apartment blocks and the original uh, Old Mount Street's gone. But this, say it's the same layout. Now, Thomas said he lived at number nine and he lived all but one to his mum, which is where he ran um, when this sort of, it all started kicking off. And if I'm gonna take you to the exact spot, going off the old map, I would probably say that number nine would be roughly, just roughly a couple, couple of yards up here. Now this behind me is the, the exact spot or near as damn it like I say of where Burgess actually shook up the lamp oil to get it really going and stoked it and he launched it straight at him with no fear, no, you know, there was nothing in his head to sort of, he was a fearless character, a fearless individual and he was everything that you would despise in a person. He was the epitome of it and like I say, he was reckless, he was carefree and he shut the lamp up that night and he smashed it straight into the face of Thomas, um, setting him on fire completely. But you've just got to imagine the horror and the shock, not just from Thomas, who, who obviously like died of it, but imagine watching it and spectating what's just happened in front of your eyes, the screams, the cries, everything. And it all took place right here. Can you imagine how it would have been? And like I say, he was, poor Thomas, he, he had a little girl as well, and he died really young, um, leaving his, obviously his daughter grew up without a dad. But Burgess was one wicked character. and He's just had this sort of persona about him that he didn't care. He didn't even care about the police. He didn't care about the repercussions. He didn't care about anyone or anything, even his girlfriend. Um, like you probably have already seen in the video, he, he took her eye out. Like this guy was absolutely mental and he wasn't, um, how can I put it? He wasn't the leader of his gang. He was the right hand man to the main guy, but he was just known for being this absolute insane, crazy. There, there was no sort of, there was nothing that he wouldn't do. There was no line he, could, he wouldn't cross. He would do anything and hurt anybody that got in his way. And you've just got to look at sort of assessing him. Like, how do you assess somebody like that? He's, he's sort of, um, how can I put it? You know, he's a product of his environment around here. The poverty, the street violence, the gangs, the crime. Um, you've just got to mix that in with some, with the desperation, the, the hunger um, and things like that. And you get this character that is just so against the system. But that night he came down this street and he killed poor Thomas. Um, and it happened right here on Old Mount Street. And he came from Nicholas Street, which is, was just behind here. Um, and he came over, like, like I said, shaking the lamp oil and burst Thomas into flames. He was screaming, his, his whole face was scorched. The inside of his, up his nose, inside of his mouth, everything. And sadly, he died, you know, as a result of a stupid argument gone wrong. Um, but there was no remorse from from Henry's side. He didn't really care. And out of all that, after what happened, he only got 12 months. You know, it's nothing. He, he, he took somebody's life. Um, but like I say, this is one story of a place around here, Angel Meadow, that you just would not have cut through, you wouldn't have even walked around here um, over just over 100 and odd years ago. Right, so I'm in Wee Cemetery in Salford, um, and as you can see, this place is enormous it's absolutely massive it goes all the way that way goes all the way that way it is huge and we came here last week to try and find the grave um, and the resting place of Henry Burgess who I think on a personal level I think Henry Burgess was 
the worst of the worst. I think he was, out of all the scuttlers that I've read about and all the scuttling gangs there were, I just think Henry was, he was made, cut from a different cloth. I don't think he was all there upstairs, if I'm being completely honest, because some of the things that he did, you know, he was, he was a menace, just a total, total menace. Um, and I came here last week with my dad and we searched for over two hours trying to find his grave and we could not find him. But as luck would have it, we've actually found his grave. Um, and I can't believe it when I came here. I came round, I'll show you the, the footage in a minute. But I came here and, and we was filming, we couldn't find him. And I said to my dad, we better call it a day. We've been here ages and it was freezing. So we started filming some of these graves. Now some of these graves in the war, they got basically this section got blitzed and you'll see some of the holes in the graves are actual shrapnel from the uh, bombs that were dropped over Salford and Manchester on the docks um, and I came in particular to film this now I was filming this grave here because of the shrapnel hole that went right through it and lo and behold I was filming my camera through it and I didn't know <laughs> and I'm pointing my camera through the hole and it's only pointing at Henry Burgess's grave. And if you just look here, I'm doing a transition shot through that hole, which is directly aiming at this grave here. And this is the grave of Henry Burgess. So how uncanny is that? Anyway, I'll flip the camera around now and I'll show you his grave. So here we are. This is the grave of Henry Burgess, the notorious scuttler. Now he gave people the slip when he was alive and he's given me the slip in death. <laughs> um, but to actually find this grave, I'll just read it out to you. It says, treasured memories of Henry, beloved husband of Janet Burgess, who died on the 21st of March, 1936, aged 64. A beautiful memory left behind. Also Janet, his dearly loved wife, who died on the 9th of May, 1952, aged 76 years reunited and uh, this seems quite well not new but it's new uh, newish so you know he's, he's obviously his, his kids have put this here possibly some years ago but it always amazed me the story of Henry and, and what he did and you know to finally find his actual spot where he's buried you know this guy was he was like I say he was cut from a different cloth um, but I'm, I'm surprised to see that he lived quite a normal uh, lifespan, really. I mean, to make it to in his 60s uh, back then, and considering the life that Henry led, you know, is, is something that I really didn't think would happen. I thought he would have died young, um, you know, considering the lifestyle that he had. But this guy, that we can see his grave here, this guy absolutely terrorised Manchester. And the stories of Henry, and what he did are still spoken about today. They're written in books, they're written by reporters, they're actually, there's, there's information about what he did online. And like I say, he terrorized the streets of Manchester. He put fear into every single person that he sort of touched. And in 2023, we now have his, his grave right in front of me. So this, it's the final resting place of who I would class as Manchester's number one most notorious scholar. Henry lived a life he could write a book about. And the story of his life has come full circle. And it's ended here. And it all took place right here. But as luck would have it, we've actually found his grave. From the mean streets of the meadow, to the cold ground of the cemetery. His name well and truly etched into the chapters of the past. I often wonder how the rest of his life played out. Did he turn it all around? Walking away from the gangs and criminality? In some ways he must have, when it looks like he found love in his wife Janet and the kids. Maybe that's all he needed all along. Who knows? But back in his heyday, the stories of the wild man of Angel Meadow will be forever grained into the history books.
of Manchester's past. So I probably should have started off with this really in the beginning, but the word scuttle are derived from the word scuttle. Now a scuttle meaning a quick fight, like a quick outburst, so basically a fight lasting no longer than like 10, 20 seconds. And in the very, very, very first video that I ever did on the scuttle was back in like 2019. Um, I documented this, so I don't really want to go over old ground, but the, the sort of few decades that Scotland was was like infamous really they basically over time it stopped and people were wondering well how did they stop this crime and what you know what were the the actions that they took and the government what did they do about it now they introduced the the lads clubs they were called basically like your Salford lads clubs and the Adelphi lads clubs and rather than them fighting on the street and getting into a load of bother and trouble they basically said like come to our gym it's a lads club come down you can do boxing you can do sport and they'd basically challenge each other uh, different gangs in different ways through the means of sport so over time this sort of stamped out the scuttling phase and it was a success and i often think today you know with society we're sort of going down that route again when you take into consideration all the knife crime that there is and the gang crime and the closing communities, this is the thing, the, the closing the communities and offering nothing to the kids of the, you know, ex exactly like how I grew up, just on the street playing. They offer nothing other than, you know, go and play football with your mates or something. And I think that's where we're going wrong as a society. As a society. And I don't want to get too political or too philosophical, but this is proven to help communities and help stamp out these cultures and these youths of crime, you know, and it worked with the scuttlers and I'm sure it would work today. So what was the motive behind the scuttling gangs? Now, in this video, you'll see that I highlight some of the tragedies and the deaths, but that wasn't always the case. They didn't go out to inflict, you know, to intentionally kill anybody. They basically went out to a stamp authority from their gang onto another gang and to beat a scuttling gang on their own turf was the biggest insult you could ever give them it wasn't about women and it weren't about the money it was purely pride it was a pride thing so say the angel meadow lads turned over the prussia street lads you know word would spread far and wide that they just turned them over and beat them and that was the biggest sort of achievement that you could get now the scuttlers Basically, the main form of their weapon was the belt and the belt buckle in particular. This was basically used as like a sword to them. It would be wrapped around the wrist with just enough slack that the, the buckle was sort of loose and flapping around. And it would use, be used to split another, you know, scuttler's head clean open. Um, it was to scar and to maim and to say, I did that scar on him. Their head boy's got a big scar down his eye. That was because I did it. You know, it was, it was sort of pride and they would sharpen the belt buckle and add stuff to it. So they'd put screws and bolts and nails and attach it to the buckle. And um, it'd be used basically as a sword in battle. Now, what was another like key thing for them is they would go and get, so say if they beat the head boy of the Angel Meadow lads to take his belt and they basically, every time that they beat another scuttling gang, they used to try and set the belt off them. And they were used as trophies to these scuttlers so they'd have a, in the bedroom, they probably had them on a shelf, like we are, I've got the Angel Meadow lads belt, I've got the Prussia Street lads belt, and they were used as trophies. Apologies for all the sound and the noise. I've tried to find a, a, a quiet spot in town, but it's absolutely impossible. Now, like I said, there wasn't there to, to kill people, even though it did happen. Um, Cause at the end of the day, these were only young lads. They wanted to basically be up and, and be feared on the streets, but a lot of them were mummy's boys still. They wanted to go home and go back to the mum. <laughs> and they didn't want to do the time and they didn't want to, definitely didn't want to be slammed up in strange ways. So the main objective for a scuttler was to beat the other gang on their patch. Walter Armstrong wasn't your typical scuttler. He was flamboyant and charismatic, and totally out of the ordinary. Born into a family of poverty, he was one of nine children, 
but he refused to dress like the rest of the people he was surrounded by. Mill workers, foundrymen, hawkers and labourers. And even though he did work in a factory himself, he stayed true to his immaculate identity. In a society of the working class, he was exceptionally well dressed. Most of his clothing must have been stolen from the upper class areas of Salford and Manchester, or bought from the profit of his criminal lifestyle. He was sharp, edgy, and had an eye for the finer things in life. He went by the nickname of Doll on his accountability for fashionable clothing, and he was the head boy of the Adelphi lads. A small but fierce mob of scuttlers, operating mainly on the Adelphi side of Salford. But they also established themselves in other territories, such as Rockley Gardens and Broad Street. His reputation soon spread as being a sneaky kind of scuttler. He was short in stature, and his gang was usually outnumbered by the bigger gangs of the area. But some of these scuttling gangs were wary of Doll, as he wouldn't think twice about brandishing his blade or using it if necessary. But being so hasty with his blade would land him in serious trouble. And on a red hot summer's night, back in 1876, Doll would regret doing just that. John Conway and Tom Martin were well-known scuttlers in the Pendleton area of Salford. They were out having a few beers in the local alehouse, and as the night was drawing a close, Last they decided to walk home. As they left the pub, they spotted a gang of scuttlers on their patch. And one of these scuttlers stood out in particular that John recognised all too well. I know who he is. It was Doll. That's Doll Armstrong. John and Doll had an altercation only a few weeks earlier, which resulted in Walter pulling out a flip knife and threatening to use it against him. Sensing the danger, and with a little Dutch courage behind him, John approached Doll and confronted him, saying, why did you pull that knife out on me the other week? To which Doll replied, I'll pull another one out. I'll pull another one out. John's mate Tom pulled him away, convinced them both to walk away. But having been confronted in front of his own gang, Doll took this as a public insult and he didn't want to lose face. He charged at John and a fist fight erupted. Both parties tried to intervene and split up the fight and just as the two were being pulled apart Walter reached into his back pocket <laughs> pulling out a knife and swiftly stabbed John straight through the chest with each heartbeat blood pulsated more and more Walter walked away his honour fulfilled leaving John lay on the floor in a pool of blood. As John lay bleeding on the floor, his mate Tom came to his aid and carried him to the doctor's surgery. You're gonna be alright mate, just stay, stay awake, awake. Keep, awake. keep awake, come on, come on. By this point he was drifting in and out of consciousness <sighs> and the doctors feared the worst. I don't think I'm gonna make it. Explaining to Tom that he didn't think he'd see the night out believing he was going to die. John Conway confessed to who did the malicious act. He said there was bad blood between us. There's bad blood between and us. And Doll lunged at him with a knife during the scuttle. Doll lunged at him with a knife. And as the night crept on, John miraculously made it through the night. And incredibly, he survived. Given he was in safe hands, the focus now turned to Doll and the police were in hot pursuit. They searched high and low, knocking door to door, 
when suddenly it was spotted. Doll made a run for it. With two police officers on his tail, they cornered him down a backyard of an old house. And with nowhere to run, it looked like the chase was over. Until Doll scrambled up the water spout and onto the rooftop. The officers sent for reinforcements, and by this time a crowd had formed in the street as Doll was stranded on the rooftop, and as the police made their way onto the roof, suddenly Doll vanished. There was nowhere to be seen. And with a huge crash, one of the policemen fell straight through the roof and landed in the bedroom of a sleeping family. Jesus Christ! Somehow Walter had made his way out and scrambled down the side of the house, but only to be met by a cluster of police officers. And he was eventually captured. Walter Doll Armstrong was sentenced to five years of penal servitude. And once the sentence was cast, it was noted that he appeared unmoved and showed no emotion and no remorse as a result of his sentence. So I think it's safe to say that Walter was a very dangerous individual and like many of these scuttlers they all had the same trait in them there was there was wild and there was selfish and there was wicked because they didn't care about the repercussions and the feared nobody and you'd think that would be enough to scare someone off you know getting put in prison you'd think it'd be enough to put people off the, the life of crime but the story of Walter didn't end there As the years rolled on Walter was still causing havoc petty crime, stealing assaults until one day he met, fell in love and married Mary Elizabeth Booth. She seemed to have calmed him down a little even though he was still involved in criminal activities but sadly for him the love he had for his wife wasn't as strong as the love he had for the life of crime. Doll saw himself into another prison sentence. Whilst he was slammed up inside, Mary Booth was invited to a flower show by George Woolley, who was a professional cricket player and he played for Hebden Bridge Cricket Club. He was quite a well known figure at the time and a total contrast to Doll. He took her away from the street life of Salford and into the blissful countryside. He treated her well, and it wasn't long before she fell in love with him, leaving Doll as a result. And shortly after she met George, she fell pregnant to him. But this sparked much controversy, as Doll was convinced that the baby was his. He said that the dates didn't add up, and the unborn child was definitely his, to which Mary insisted it wasn't. But back then for a woman to have an affair during a marriage was the biggest insult to a man, and this severely hit Doll hard. Upon his release from prison, right, come on, you, you've had enough. Doll began to drink heavily. Get off. He couldn't believe what had happened, not only as his wife left him, but he was potentially the father of a baby too and there was nothing he could do about it as Mary had eloped with a now newfound boyfriend and baby his life was a mess he was severely depressed and the only thing that Doll could do to mask the pain was to drink until yet again he was arrested for being drunk and disorderly in Salford he was taken to the Salford Town Hall and thrown in a cell to which he apparently kicked off banging on the cell door shouting abuse to all the officers but then all of a sudden the police officer said that the cell went eerily silent and the once animated Doll Armstrong could be heard no more after a few moments passed the officer decided to check on Walter and upon reaching the cell door 
he found him hanging by the neck. And sadly Walter had taken his own life. A troubled soul from the minute he was born, and a troubled man later in life. The struggles of prison, the life of crime, and the love of his life must have been all too much for him to take. He must have felt enough was enough. And just like that, the once flamboyant, charismatic scuttler from Salford, Walter Dahl Armstrong, was no more. Right, so I'm in the beautiful Bexley Square in Salford and I've always loved this little bit because of that pub there, the New Oxford. It's a brilliant pub, but I'm not here for that today. Um, I'm here to document basically the last place that Walter Doll Armstrong um, visited. Now, this behind me used to be the Town Hall. This was Salford Town Hall. And you'll have already seen in the video that Walter got arrested. He was, he was drunk and disorderly. Um, and they dragged him here kicking and screaming. He didn't want to come here. And in the bottom of this building, there is cells. And the fruit room in the cell, and like I say, the, the sort of ward and the, the police officer that arrested him, he said he, he was banging, uh, screaming, going mad. Just bangs. Um, he was kicking off, basically, and he was banging on his cell. And then all of a sudden, the cell just went quiet. And they decided to check up on him. And when they did, you know, they found that he'd um, he took his own life and he'd hung himself. Now all I can imagine is, I know that he had a lot going on at the time. There was a lot of, um, he's having a lot of arguments and he, his head was basically up his ass with his missus. Um, and she'd, you know, basically they were both just toxic together. And I think, obviously, he was he was very drunk too, but he must have been in a, a bit of a state to take his own life. But it happened right here behind me. And, like I say, it was the end of Walter Doll Armstrong, the flamboyant, the charismatic sort of scuttler that was totally different to the rest. You know, he was, um, how can I put it, all the scuttlers, they were rough and ready, and, and Walter was rough and ready too, but he just had this air of sort of... He felt, he felt like he was better than everyone, basically, and he dressed differently. He was just quite a flamboyant character, which was very, very rare back then, um, and very rare for a, a scuttler as well, you know. But this is, like I say, right behind me here. This is where Walter Doll Armstrong took his last breath. Now I know these stories are dark, but I can't help but think of how things could have been different. What a different kind of upbringing have produced different results. Worthy as some would say, the product of their environment as desperate times produce desperate people. And they can make good people turn bad, but upon reflection, the fact of the matter is, they were born into a completely different era to us. And I know we all have our own struggles today. And in some respects there are similarities. But their struggles and hardship were totally different to the ones we face today. Having to witness your brothers and sisters die before you. Because the family can't afford to feed them must have been really hard to cope with. On top of the disease, no sanitation, the sewage, poverty, living in unimaginable conditions in the rat infested overcrowded houses. Some families being forced to raise their own down the cold steps of the dwellings. Not forgetting the carcinogenic smog 
that bellowed from the chimney tops and the factories, that loomed over the city like a black cape. If you had to witness that before your very eyes, I'm sure we'd all act a bit differently. Maybe these people wouldn't have turned into the savages that they sadly became. So I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone that's took the time out to watch this video once again. Um, if you enjoyed the first one, I hope you enjoyed this one, the second one. And I just want to let you all know once again about Carol and the great work that she's done. So go over and find Carol. Um, check her website out, get in touch with her if you need anything doing on your family tree. Uh, I want to thank Days of Horror Chris for igniting the flame and the, the passion and the inspiration in me to go and find and delve into the story of Henry Burgess. And I also want to thank my dad and his, uh, his girlfriend Sharon for helping me find the actual grave of Henry Burgess in Wee Cemetery. So if you like these videos, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you would sub to the channel. It's completely up to you, but it just helps, helps the channel grow and ultimately keeps me motivated into making these videos. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching both of these videos. And until the next one, I'll see you all soon. Cheers.